right. Thanks. Laura's gonna uh, be our slide video mastermind here, and I'm gonna help facilitate some questions and so forth. Uh, so as she said, we have five projects, five projects that we're gonna show off this afternoon. Uh, if you are a prospective student, somebody who's never been to Turing, then maybe you're joining us to uh, learn about some of the work that folks do when they're in the program and uh, what teams are capable of in, in a pretty short period of time. Maybe you're a current student and getting a little bit of a preview of what might you might do in Mod 3, Mod 4, et cetera. And for alums, well, you've seen it all before and thanks for coming and whether presenting your own project or supporting other ones, I'm glad to have you this afternoon. So our agenda, well, you can go to two slides, Laura. Um, our agenda this afternoon is that we're going to have these presentations. Uh, each one has a video that's about five minutes, um, and then we'll have opportunities for the judges to ask some questions. Um, if you have burning questions, you can throw them in the chat, and I think uh, maybe after they get done with the judge questions, might be able to respond to those. But yeah, we'll have judges ask a couple questions, uh, usually one question per judge per project. And then after we finish all the projects, the uh, it'll be just the four like student projects that are kind of in ju official judging consideration. The judges and I will step away to a little breakout room, um, pick our top two and come back around, announce some winners and we'll be done. I would guess it's going to take us about 75 minutes, ballpark, um, just over an hour. And then we can talk about the judges. So we have three judges with us today, Rob, Priya, and Hugh. Uh, you'll be hearing from them as soon as we get into, um, get into the first round of questions from the first project. So... Thanks y'all for joining us and let's fire it up with dwelling reports. Not weather together, none of this, just dwelling reports. I'm sorry y'all, one You're, second. It's a little, it's kind of annoying with Google slides. Sometimes you click anything and it just starts advancing. Yeah, it's just like, no, nah, I, I wanna do what I wanna do. All yeah. right, this should work now. I'm gonna mute myself. Uh, my name is Jonathan Beckman. I finished Turing in 2017 in a 1705 front-end cohort. So same class as Travis Rollins. I think he's still here teaching. Hey, Travis, good to see you. Um, thanks for letting me share my, my app with you today. Uh, this is a little side project I've been working on that I call Dwelling Reports. Uh, and the idea behind Dwelling Reports is to uh, provide automated reporting for real estate agents to send out to their clients. So like the, the little flyers you might get in your mailbox about uh, your house and your neighborhood and information uh, about homes that have sold, things like that. Um, we offer that as an automated email service. Um, so to get into it, uh, the front end's built in React, the forms here, uh, I use React hook forms for, um, and this is for setting up a new client. Uh, to make things a little quicker, I've already set up Travis here as a client of mine, so I can click in here and view Travis's information. Uh, Travis has a nice little property here in Fort Collins. We'll check out the report for that property. Um, so when an agent's setting up a report uh, through that form I just showed you, they can set up a couple of different um, filter points here, bed baths, you know, price, things like that, and then also be able to draw on a map. Um, so the map is provided by Mapbox, and then there's a layer on top of that um, with Deck GL where you can draw a bounding box around a neighborhood or a specific area you wanna look at. Um, and so this would be the subject property. You can click into these little cards and open them up and see again on the map where it is and then get some more information about it and uh, look at pictures. And all this data is, is coming from the MLS. Uh, and then we have the rest of the properties that are, that are listed here. Um, down here on the right side, you can view them here. And then also here on the charts. Um, you can see these charts are built with uh, VizX, which is something provided by Airbnb. It's a library that helps you work uh, with D3 a little bit easier. Um, but you can see these other properties here, click into them. Uh, same, same deal, view some more information, look at some pictures. Um, and then we have these charts for 
a few different things, square footage, um, how, how long it took your house to sold, how long it was on the market, um, just to give you an idea about what's going on in your neighborhood. So uh, this is really the core of the app. This is the report that a client would get. And uh, in order to send this report out, you can click this button here. Uh, this is a, a template that I've built with uh, React email, I think it's what it's called, um, for a little email template that will go out and this has a link to that specific report. And then you can send it here. And that sending is done through a resend is what is what's called. Um, so we can take a look at some of the architecture behind all of this. Um, so the app was built with React on the front end, use Tailwind CSS um, for styling, and then I, I use Auth0 for user authentication. I have three different servers set up, two small ones, a payment server for Stripe to authenticate payments, and then email um, for, for sending out those emails with resend. And then our, our main server is a node server, uh, which is written with Apollo GraphQL for the query language and MongoDB document database. Um, and then the rest of it all lives in Amazon. Um, so what I mean by that is, is everything is hosted in, in S3 buckets, including the client. The client is, is hosted in S3 and then distributed with uh, CloudFront distribution. Um, and then the, the servers are, uh, they also live in S3, but are, they run in Lambda functions and then they, they get served up through API Gateway. Uh, and then Lambda there talks to, to CloudWatch for, for logging. Um, so I use serverless framework, which is this little square here. Uh, serverless framework for deploying uh, the servers out. It's just a little YAML config file um, in the repo and then and you run a command and they'll just kind of deploy for you into AWS, which is really easy and nice. I uh, use Cloudflare for the, the DNS management and GitHub Actions for CSC pipeline for the client side. Uh, the APIs I'm talking to you is the MLS, uh, which is offered through Bridge Interactive. Um, and so that's how we get our data. And this is the only one that we work with. Um, so things that were, were new to me when I built this project was uh, using GraphQL that was new and shiny and I wanted to try it. So um, I, I used that and learned that for this project. Um, and then I've been managing my work through Trello. Uh, just have a Trello board for tracking bugs and uh, just keeping up with progress. Um, but yeah, that's about all the time I have today. So thanks for letting me share my app with you. Uh, my name is Jonathan Beckman. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, talk about a couple questions. I, I'll give you a first question, which is the whole time I'm thinking about MLS data and the API integration there. Um, was curious, like, as you've worked with, an API where it's giving you source data that is input by tens of thousands of realtors across the country would seem to me like a kind of data management nightmare, right? In terms of there's going to be weird characters and things missing and things that are too short and too long and all that. And was just curious as you've worked with the API, number one, like, did you have to pay a lot for access to the API? I'd be surprised if you can pull that kind of information for free. And then number two, like what have you learned working with the API and like how did it influence any of like how you built your software? Oh, we have to give Jonathan the permission to unmute though. Hold on one sec. <laughs> uh, let me see what, I'm gonna click this and then that should work, yeah. I think. There we go. All right, you hear me? Yeah. Cool. Sorry about that. Thanks. No worries. Um, yeah, so MLS data is like pretty restricted. Um, it's it's in a, <clears throat> I don't know if you call it a protocol or what, but it's called O data. And so instead of like, like JSON, uh, you have to, well, I guess it's maybe how you query their database. You have to build out this just crazy string. So that piece is hard to work with, with, with the MLS. Um, but the data itself is pretty standardized across MLSs. Um, there are a few MLS specific data points. Um, for example, like square footage for some reason is a part of that, like specific MLS like you know field. Um, so there's a few things where you kind of have to dynamically access a few few pieces um, when you're gonna like when you're working with a bunch of different MLS um, data sets, but. Um, far and wide, I think it's like mostly standardized. So it's pretty, pretty easy to work with. As far as cost goes, you have to go through 
only brokerages are allowed to have access to the MLS. So you have to work with a brokerage um, and it costs, it's like 250 bucks for an initiation fee and then 20 bucks a month after that um, per brokerage. So it could be expensive, but it just kind of depends on like, I guess if you have a business, what your pricing model looks like and you know how that washes out. So <clears throat> yeah, that makes sense. Um, it's really like not too bad. If you can, if you can get through the hoops of the, of the sign up and so forth. Yeah. That's um, the hard part. That makes sense. Uh, Rob, Bria, Hugh, any, uh, judge questions you want to get in there? Uh, the one that I would say like might be valuable for people to hear is like, uh, so I'm assuming the serverless is deployed as like Lambda functions, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. like, why, why would you choose to use like a Lambda function serverless based approach versus like a traditional like hosted server yeah um it, for me like this is probably a bit overkill right like having a bunch of serverless architecture for for a very small you like amount of users but scalability would probably be the biggest win um with that like your lambda functions will scale indefinitely you know as long as, long as you can pay for them i guess uh you know they'll scale up so I guess you can, I don't know how like with Elastic Beanstalk or other, other like ELB type things that are in AWS, like that you can use to, for scalability. I'm sure those are there and in place, but Lambda functions are small, they're cheap. Like it's just, they're easy to, to, to use. Um, so it, it requires a lot less work to get your server in a Lambda function. I guess in my opinion, it requires a lot less work to get your server in a Lambda function than it does into like you know, a, a solid state like server, like you're running all the time. I have a piggy what you're doing on you. Like, sorry. Sorry, I was saying, um, I have a piggyback question kind of off of that, like the MLS API potentially being expensive. So in a theoretical world where it was cost per query or even batch of query, let's say 1,000 query, 10,000 queries, what would you do in the future to ensure not just query performance and optimization, but potential for caching, indexing, et cetera? Or do you already have a plan in place? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I'll give you an example. I was So when you get a property, you're required by the MLS to display the listing brokerage and the listing agent. Um, and you can't get that information off of the property object itself. So you have to go and query the office uh, endpoint to get the office information in order to, you know, list out that information for, you know, whatever. Well, it turns out I was just being stupid and I wasn't like using the API correctly. <clears throat> um, and you can kind of expand those fields in one call. So one, like learning how to do, like reading documentation and learning how to do things correctly is important. Um, not just like doing it, like I got it and it was do it was working, but I was also making 30 subsequent API calls to get all this office data that I didn't need to do. Um, so one, just, you know, like check yourself and read, read the docs. And then also like with the MLS specifically, this, this API allows you to build data sets within their API. So you can pull from maybe several different MLSs and build up a data set for yourself. It's kind of acts as a cache. Um, for you but then you could also just you know use redis or use some other caching service to cache yourself but the thing with mls like the reason it's so cool is because it's all like the latest data right like if, if you list your house this morning it's going to be in the mls now so that's kind of the thing that you want is to be able to get all that latest data so you'd always have to go kind of check and be sure like you know you're getting you're getting the latest stuff I have a question that's uh, not not so technical, but um, just out of curiosity, do you have real users using this right now? And like, what's your strategy for growing it? Do you actually have like a LLC or a C Corp set up? And um, yeah, like what's your long-term hope and vision for this? Also, yeah, looks right. uh, thanks. <laughs> retirement, man, retirement. Um, <laughs> no, yeah. uh, the... We do have, we're sort of in like an alpha testing phase, I guess. We've got probably three people on it um, that are using it uh, in Fort Collins. And uh, yeah, like like I said, it's it's restricted by brokerage. And so that, as far as like a business aspect goes, that's a 
pretty big roadblock where you've got to start like uh, relationships with brokerages in order to kind of expand. Like if I wanted access to the MLS here in Denver, I'd need to go out and like get a partnership with a brokerage, pay that 250 bucks and then 20 bucks a month after just to hope someone signs up like that's in their brokerage. So um, there's a few like business pieces that I'm not so good at <clears throat> to kind of figure out with these things. But, but yeah, I mean, the goal is for sure to like maybe replace my job and uh, hopefully build this thing as big as it can be, but we'll see. <laughs> so you're accepting junior business partner applications. So that's what you're <laughs> saying here. Somebody's already put that MBA to work. Um, thanks Jonathan for bring in some alumni distant alumni perspective yeah. and, and showing off your project. Um, it's really great. Awesome. And thanks, thanks judges for a couple quick questions here. Now for the official part, jumping into the student projects with weather together. Howdy folks. Let's talk about the weather together. I'd like to start off with the demo. Weather together is a weather guessing game. You will receive a randomly generated weather data set. You will then pick a location on the map that you think most closely matches the weather data you were given. You will receive a score where zero is the best possible score, kind of like golf, and 20,000 is the worst possible, possible score. I'm gonna go ahead and head over to our login page. Um, just gonna toggle the theme here so you see that we do have a dark and light mode. Uh, and then I'm gonna sign in. Let's take just a second. Okay, so we're logging in. So this is our weather da data set that we're trying to get closest to. Uh, I'm just going to try to pick something not really that close, but just something to show you how it works. We can submit our guess. Um, and so this should be closest to Winthrop there, it says. Uh, so it's going to show you a picture of the closest location that has a picture, picture for. Um, we then also have a wiki page here if you want to learn more about that place. It'll show you that total score. Not great, not terrible. Uh, I'm going to go to the dashboard. It's going to show you our daily game stats. This is how many times we played it and all of the stats where our scores lie. We also have a competitive game mode, which is a forecast. So you're guessing three days in the future. Um, it also will give you a rank here of how you're doing in that uh, competitive stats. Um, that is against everybody in the entire uh, website. Anyone that's a part of it is there. It will also show you your last three games played. Um, and it will send you an email once that three days is up and tell you how you do in each individual game. Uh, and then there's custom games that you can create here for you and your friends. I'm gonna go ahead and create a new one for us. Um, I like the Fighting Hens, it's a great name in my opinion. Uh, we're gonna create this for 100 days long and our guest lead time uh, is gonna be two days. So it's similar to the, uh, the competitive game in that way that you get to uh, change your lead time. Um, and I'm just gonna invite myself uh, because I am actually on Michael's um, account here. So whenever I add myself, uh, it's going to show you the invitees. We can go ahead and create the game. Um, it'll show you the leaderboard there. Um, no one scored anything yet. This application was built using several languages and frameworks across three different repositories. We had our primary backend repository that was built using Rails and Ruby that houses the majority of the game logic. We had our location information microservice, which was built using Java and Spring Boot that gathers information such as images and a Wikipedia article on uh, locations where votes were submitted. And we had our front-end repository that was built using React and a combination of TypeScript and JavaScript that houses the logic for the user interface. Now for a little more in-depth view at the backend. As mentioned previously, the Rails repository executes the bulk of the game logic. The daily game processes votes synchronously while the competitive and custom games process their votes asynchronously once a day using cron jobs. The location information microservice agglomerates info from several restrictive APIs to deliver for the daily game vote. It will try and find information for the most specific location possible using available API calls and some prior requests that are stored in the database. We decided to tackle optimization in some portions of the backend portion of the Rails app. And the first thing we implemented was Honeycomb, which was a general tool observability tool. And it shows us stuff such as current errors, the slowest API calls and how long they take. And we can drill down and take a closer look at the stack trace of any of those slower API calls to get a better idea of what's going on. And this really informs the team of the slowest points for any user and how we could implement some changes, either using caching or a background worker somewhere in the backend portion to kind of speed up any of the process. Hi, I'm Ben, and I was one of the team members on the front end side of the application. One of the main challenges that front-end groups faced was the large size of the application. Because of this, the back-end and front-end team worked together to complete this portion of the project. We used React for functional components that could be reused again when necessary, 
such as for the header, map, and footer. Additionally, TypeScript was used while building this application. In TypeScript, some errors that would only be caught at runtime in JavaScript were instead caught while compiling. This was particularly helpful to backenders who are trying to learn front end, as many errors were caught far earlier. Brendan used React Router to implement a multi-page application. He used local storage as well to implement sessions. Despite the large size of the application and the large team, we were able to avoid letting things slip through the cracks and we were able to achieve a cohesive product. I'm Tommy Takahashi from the backend frontend team and I'll be talking about a couple of frontend features that we added to our app. We utilize the Lottie React library that enables a seamless integration of Adobe After Effects animations, which we exported as JSON files and then implemented into our app. We also implemented the ternary light and dark react hook to dynamically add a switch feature which toggles between light and dark color schemes based on the user's preferences. Thanks for coming. Here's a list of all our contributors. Thanks guys. Go out and explore some weather together. Thanks weather together team. Um, judges, if you get ready with a question, would you throw that zoom thumbs up in there? Um, I wanted to, I think this is maybe a Tommy question based on who was talking about it, but you said something quickly about like exporting animations from Adobe Premiere and like making them web ready or something like that. I never heard of anything like that. So can you like talk about what the hell, how that works? That ben might wild, need to Tommy. help me out. We had actually okay. someone who kind of supported uh, uh, earlier during Capstone with that. Um, we just wanted to kind of highlight it because it was definitely cool and we utilized it across um, the app uh, with the animations in there. Um, but from my understanding, we utilized uh, the Lottie uh, web library to get those animations um, to implement into the app. I don't know if you might be able to explain a little more on how we did that, Ben. So uh, I know we used Lottie. Chris Butler was the one who was uh, mainly implemented that. He is, did not, is not uh, come to continue on with us but he is the one i know who really implemented it so all right a research project for another day cool well glad it worked out uh hugh yeah uh i, I actually really like the animations so I, i'm gonna have to like take a look at that i thought that was a real lot of fun um in ter i think it's really cool that you gamified this i'm curious about how you thought about like people participating in a single game at the same time. And then also maybe how you handled uh, like authentication. Cause I know you said you were logged in with one user but we didn't really go over the login flow. Like how did you handle that? So as far as multiple people playing at the same time there are accounts, um, let's see. Um, when we originally developed the app uh, it was using OAuth, um, and then we ended up scrapping that front end just because we switched from Rails front end to a um, to a React front end, um, and then the OAuth got uh, scrapped for I forget what uh, the name of what we actually used was. Um, so the games are meant to be played daily, like kind of like Wordle. So you you play the game once, you get your score. Um, you wait till the next day and then you accrue stats over time. And then there's the other game modes just in case that isn't enough. So the competitive mode is also played once per day. And then you can create a bunch of games with friends to play those. And each of those is a different target. Love it. Thanks. Bria? Yeah. Um, oh, I've got two questions and I don't know which one to pick. Uh... Both. Do them both. Okay, I'll, I'll, I wanted to start with the animation one, and this is just a like a gentle question. It's not necessarily meant to like harm or any way, shape, or form. But I see a lot of animations, and I love animations. But from an accessibility standpoint, I'm very curious what you are doing on your site. And I'm just going to call out specifically animations. For example, if I was a person who had motion reduced, are those animations still, or are they considered essential? So we did not. Uh... We did not uh, you, uh, take that into consideration, but it's something we will consider for the future and we can continue in, uh, working uh, on that. 
Absolutely. No, I just was curious. Uh, I haven't actually tested it or anything myself. I was just, I saw animations and that's top of mind for projects I'm currently working on. So that's all it comes from. Uh, <laughs> my second question is about your goal. On y'all's repo, you say the goal is to provide public education and increase awareness of general global climate trends in a fun and interactive manner. And I'm very just curious on that very first page, I could have missed it. How are you achieving that goal or or throughout the site, throughout the workflow? How are you providing that awareness and education? So part of it is just making people, I mean, uh, the weather gets pulled in from around the world and it's, it's all real live data. So if you get weather from Northern Canada and it's 30 degrees in March, which is something that's happened a lot, um, that's alarming. Um, but additionally, something we had in, uh, when we first ideated the project, we were thinking of doing like tips after each guess where it told you certain things about weather patterns. Um, uh, we didn't get to that, but that would be a feature. So if you make a guess, you get like a, hey, there's latitudes where deserts are more prevalent. That'll have low humidity, <laughs> stuff like that. Very cool. Thank you. Go for it, Rob. Uh, yeah, I, I have a few questions about like the architectural decisions. Um, first off, I noticed um, that there was a Java microservice, or um, it looked like something like that was implemented. I'm curious what sort of challenges you ran into with that, and um, what were some of the trade offs from like, uh, or like in your experience um, implementing some of these stretch technologies? And are there any that you wish you hadn't uh, implemented? Um, as far as the Java microservice goes, everything we tried um, actually worked out fairly well. It was one of those things where it just, it didn't work at all. And then once we got it going, it worked almost exactly as intended. I think that's part of the uh, positive of strongly typed language is they basically don't let you do anything until you've um, mostly built it out. We had to, when, um, one thing that was interesting was when we were building things out, we had to basically walk through like very little baby steps of uh, building out new features and whatnot, um, just because it was a completely new language as well. Um, one thing that we enjoyed learning about in particular was the use of Docker. Uh, the more I talk to people in the industry, the more uh, I hear Docker. So it was something good to have learned. Um, I think it makes uh, deployment on all sorts of different platforms um, a lot more easy or a lot easier. Cool. Well, thanks, group. Uh, nice work on Weather Together. Next up, da -da -da, chicken tracker. Now, what direction could this be going? Tracking individual chickens, keeping track of best wings in your town. I don't know. We're going to find out. Do it. Hi, welcome to Chicken Tracker. Brought to you by Stephen Nash, Quinn Nordmark, Yen Porter, Isaac Mitchell, with special help from Meg Roth, Charles Wren, and Dylan Perry. Chicken Tracker is a farm management application that is aimed primarily at small farmers and homesteaders. It lets users track their outdoor animals, allowing them to feel connected to their much-loved furry friends. Log in and you will be taken to your user dashboard where you can see the number and types of animals you currently have, view important events or appointments for the week, and view and access your current shelters. To get a closer look at the specific shelter, click on the sidebar shelters button. Here we can see our shelters displayed with the number of animals in each. If we click on a shelter, it will take us to a shelter show page where we can see a more specific list of animals residing in this particular shelter. We'll also see a monthly calendar to view a longer range of appointments. We can edit or delete a shelter from here as well. From here, we can add or create a new animal as an addition to this shelter. Click on create new animal, enter your animal's names, species type, birthday, and color. Click save. We're redirected to this animal show page with some information about the chicken. If 
we would like, we can add a photo. Choose the file and click submit. And here we have Angelina Bo Peep displayed on her own show page. Our chicken tracker app is unconventional in the sense that it uses the Rails framework for both the front end and the back end. It makes API calls to API ninjas through the use of Faraday. And though API ninjas wasn't our first choice because there are others with more relevant information, it was the one that was available at the low, low cost of free. And we went with that. The front end is styled with HTML and CSS, which also is styled with Bootstrap to reach one of our list of glory items, a mobile friendly design. Our two other list of glory items were timed logouts, as well as password list login through the use of Google's OAuth. And our app is hosted on Heroku. For the front end of our web application, we utilize the Bootstrap framework to do the heavy lifting. After you log in, you will be taken to the dashboard where your information about your animal shelter and animals are displayed. It was important for us that Chicken Tracker be mobile friendly because almost everyone has a phone, but not everyone has a computer. So we designed the dashboard to have a responsive sidebar. You can view your calendar, shelters, and even a list of your animals. In order to style our forms, we implemented the Simple Form gem to give our website a more modern look when creating or editing an object due to its built-in support for Bootstrap. It also offers enhanced error handling features and dry principle support with its automatic label and input associations. For our calendar, we use a simple calendar gem that made it quick and easy for use. Our users can schedule important events pertaining to their animals and see when it's coming up next. Here's your user dashboard that displays your animal stats and your shelter stats. If you click on the calendar, it'll show you your weekly calendar so you can see if you have any upcoming events. You can see a list of all of your shelters here or you can go and create a new shelter. And also, you have a list of your animals in your shelter that is easily accessible to you. The database is organized into two parts, the front end and the back end. Users has login information and nothing else. Front end then sends the user ID to the back end, where the back end uses the user ID to find all shelters that belong to that user. Shelters has many animals where both customized info about your animal is stored, such as its name, color, and birthday. And we also use an external API to retrieve data about that animal species, such as weight, lifespan, and litter size. An image of each animal may also be uploaded and stored on the front end. Images works by making its unique ID the same as its associated animal's ID. This is the animal image uploader where you can save your favorite picture of your chicken and have it display on your show page. Here we see the backend contract where we are given instructions on how to make our own front end program and the data received from each CRUD call. Thanks for tracking the chickens. Um, just to clarify, I'm I'm 95% sure I understand the answer to this, but just to clarify for everybody, what you're saying about the architecture is that you had two separate Rails applications, a front-end application, a back-end application that communicate over an API, as opposed to just one Rails application where everything's internal and it's like a conceptual separation of front-end, back-end. Is that correct? That is correct, yeah. Okay. Cool. And so then my question is like, what motivated you to build it in that fashion? And like, did you <clears throat> learn anything about it in the sense of, were you like, well, I'm never doing this again, you know, or was it like, oh, this is kind of cool, make it easier to swap in a non rails front end, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. So what were like the takeaways from that big, like huge architectural decision? Why'd you make it? Would you do it again? Yeah, I think um, it was for our consultancy project. And I think that's kind of our bread and butter, I guess. It's just Rails. So that's kind of what we knew. Um, like looking towards the future, I think we would definitely use something different on the front end. Um, yeah, um, that's what I got. Cool. Thanks. Judges, questions? Hugh? 
Yeah, I actually kind of wanted to know how you handled the the timed logout, right? Is that mostly done through like a hookup into Google OAuth or did you set certain parameters to understand like the user's gone and we should log them out? Um, for, for, for that, that was um, covered with session timeout and time cop was what uh, we used to be able to test it, but it was... Um, one of the other members spearheaded that, that isn't here today. Um, but yeah, it was with session time. Gotcha. So I would guess then it's like kind of handled in the cookie. So when you send that follow-up request, the cookies like expired kind of thing, which is ni nicer than trying to, I Hugh, when you asked the question, I was imagining like cron jobs and like checking something every minute and expiring stuff and all that too complicated kind of thing. So sounds like a good solution. Priya? Priya, we, um, we're not that good. Did it Did it unmute now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I was- I We'll blame the technology. Come on, technology yeah. was supposed to unmute. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I just like to talk to myself. Um, I, my question is like in a theoretical world where last night y'all found a bug right before demo comp, what would you and your team do? I think, um, we'd honestly just play this video where it would, it worked <laughs> and then go in, um, afterwards and, um, maybe have like a little huddle and, and, and work on it, um, add it to our project board probably and delegate some tasks um and and luckily the the night before when we were getting everything together we did go through and add a fair amount of last minute features and squash a fair amount of bugs so luckily we spent a good couple hours and got everything went the smoothest it ever went honestly in that last two hours before we got ready for it Love to hear a successful QA session. Thank you. And Rob? Yeah, I've got two questions. Um, I'm not sure if you answered the first one, but I'm curious how the storage of the images was handled, where those um, were saved. And uh, my second question is, did you consider roosters? When do you want to take the photo? Uh, yeah. So the photo, I, there's already a, uh, it was another gem. I think it's called active storage and we had it in the front end. And, um, I was looking into trying to store the thing in the back and the images in the back end. But, um, in order to do that, you would have to encrypt the image in 64 bit and then send it and then store the 64 bit in the back end, send it and then send it back into the front end and then decrypt the 64 bit and convert that back into an image. So I thought that that was going to be too hard. So I didn't do that. So uh, instead I used active storage in the front end where, um, I don't know, it kind of functions like a, it, it's basically like it gives you a bunch of classes that you can import then. And then, or sorry, it, it's not really like classes. It's more um, image. It just lets you attach like images and it creates like an image class for you. So it basically allows you to make like a has, like it has many or it has one like image thing in the in the front end. And then um, so I just use that and then you can just attach the image that way. And then I was able to um assign the uh the image ID to just the back end animal ID. So then whenever the animal ID is pulled up, then it also looks for the image ID as well. And that's it. And and I can take the question on the the rooster that would that would open up way too many possibilities for off color jokes. So chicken it. <laughs> uh, and plenty of groans were had. Um, cool. Well, thank you, chicken tracker team. I think we are ready then for Park End. Hello, welcome to Barkend, a full stack application created by front end engineers aspiring to learn how to create both a back end and a database for the first time. This application was created as part of a stretch tech project in which we chose to self teach technologies that are not part of the front end Turing curriculum. 
My name is Dana Zack, and I had the privilege of working alongside Jamie Francisco and Ricky Tran in the creation of this app. Barkin is an application aimed toward aspiring dog owners and is designed to help connect users with a rescue dog according to their needs and preferences. While the learning focus of Barkin was to build our first backend, our team still managed to create an intuitive and responsive UI. By clicking Get Started, the user is brought to the application's main page where they can view all dogs available for adoption. All dog cards and buttons throughout the application have built-in hover features to make it clear to the user what they might select. We also built in pagination to increase organization and limit the number of dogs visible per page. Based on user preferences, there are many ways to filter results. One way is with the sidebar, which allows a user to filter by size, age, gender, whether a dog is spayed or neutered, and whether a dog is verified as kid friendly. The second way is with the search bar, which allows the user to search by breed keyword. We designed the application so that these filtering features would compound upon each other. Once you click on a dog card, further dog details appear, as well as the option to favorite a dog. Once favorited, you can view that dog on the Save Dogs page. If you change your mind, you can remove a dog from the Save Dogs page by unfavoriting them. Stay tuned as we continue to improve the UI to bring you the best dog adoption application experience. Our primary goal with Barkin was to delve deeper into server-side development, particularly for front-end developers like us. We wanted to understand how back-end technologies and databases work in conjunction with front-end frameworks to create a full-stack application. This project served as an excellent opportunity for us to strengthen our skills in this area. One of the stretch technologies we decided to explore was the integration of a database with our backend. We chose PostgreSQL hosted on AWS for its reliability and scalability. This allowed us to efficiently manage and store data on dogs available for adoption. We use React for the front end hosted on Vercel, leveraging its robust UI building capabilities. We built RESTful APIs for the back end using Node.js and Express.js, also hosted on Vercel, to serve as endpoints for our front end application. These APIs handle requests from the client and interact with Postgres to retrieve and manipulate data. Additionally, our database consumed PetFinders API to fetch data about dogs available for adoption. We opted for PetFinders API because it already contained comprehensive dog information, including their traits and characteristics. This allowed us to access accurate and relevant data to populate our application, providing users with valuable information about dogs up for adoption. However, the data retrieved from PetFinders API required cleaning and structuring before being stored in our database. We used ConnectJS to define a schema and seeded our database with the cleaned information from PetFinder. Even as a small team of just three developers, it was essential for us to create a streamlined process for both our communication and development. Before writing any code, we took time to ask ourselves questions, plan our vision, design a wireframe of our MVP, and create documentation for consistency across the project when it came to code styling, commit messaging, branch naming, and pull requests. We used daily standups to get on the same page while working asynchronously, and utilized a project board to track issues and progress. With this being a stretch project and creating a full stack application for the first time, we anticipated needing extra time to grasp and implement some of the newer concepts. One of the more interesting challenges for us was the deployment process. As we had never deployed both the backend and frontend repository, we ran into some hiccups. Initially, our project was created as a mono repo without fully understanding the implications this might have in the deployment process. We turned to mentors to help troubleshoot, but in the interest of time, ultimately separated the repos and deployed them individually. While we never fully grasped the issues we were having, it opened up an opportunity for future learning and exploration with projects moving forward. Thanks team. Um, quick question I wanted to ask was like with Node.js and I have done pretty limited Node.js work myself. Um, curious, I would imagine like stepping into using Node, trying to build out a backend, you know, seeing yourself as front-end developers, et cetera, probably pretty intimidating. And I was just wondering like, how was the ramp up doing work in, in Node.js specifically and like, what'd you use to figure out how to do it? And, you know, would you kind of like learn about it in the process?
Yeah, I can step in on this one. I think um, in terms of using Node.js, the language is is pretty familiar with with JavaScript. You know, pretty much the same. So, you know, handling um, requests and things like that, we we had to you know learn how to implement uh, endpoints, which was one of our biggest learning goals. And luckily enough, I think Turing has a lot of um, good resources to learn uh, pretty much the basics of creating endpoints. And from there, um, our other challenge would be figuring out how all the um, all the technologies talk to each other. And so I think one of our most challenging aspects was learning how to implement a, a database and having it hosted on a website. That's fair. I think a lot of us still trying to figure out how to have databases connected to our freaking websites. Appropriate. Uh, thanks. And Priya, question? Okay. Um, I noticed that there isn't like a login. And so I'm, I'm very curious about what are next steps there and how is favoriting currently working? I can speak to this one. Um, so as far as future goals, um, we, we've we set up our endpoint with our Git request um, in terms of our, our backend, um, but we have yet to implement a post request or a delete request for our save dog feature. Um, so right now that's actually being stored just locally um, using like on the express, like on the express slash node backend, um, but it's not actually tied to our database yet. And so sort of our next step um, in terms of learning how the backend works and, and is connected to the database is to figure out how to do a post request and a delete request tied to our database. Thanks, Dana. And Rob? Yeah, um, my question was um, like, what, 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 what sort of uh, stuff are you storing in the database and why did you decide to um, store that data in the database as opposed to just getting it directly from uh, Petfinder? Um, I think, uh, so when, when we took a look at the data we were getting from Petfinder, there was just like a lot going on that we didn't necessarily envision using for our app. So, and also because we wanted, you know, a big focus of this project was to, you know, um, create our own tables and um, design our own database. I think we took it as an opportunity to clean up that data and structure it in a way that we wanted and, you know, not have too much un unnecessary information in there. Um, yeah, I think in the future we could think about how we would use the uh, pet finder API like in real time when we actually have users so you know these dogs are updated and can actually be adopted but I like it thanks Hugh uh yeah so uh, kudos on the UI like little, lots of little minor touches that I think were great um I also uh wrote a node backend in mod 3 as like a stretch goal as a front end engineer. And the thing that like threw me for a loop was database migrations. So like, did you run into any hiccups or like, how did you handle migrations if you found out you needed to like change a field or add a column in, in your database? I, I can speak to this one. Um, we, we did a lot of planning in advance. So luckily we didn't have to really roll back our migration and re-migrate at all. Um, but one thing that at least personally I found challenging to wrap my head around was this idea that these um, these schemas that you make, it's like multiple tables for one data set because, you know, we had an array of objects and each object was a dog. And then within that dog object, there were properties where the value was another object. And so really wrapping our heads around and understanding that each of those nested objects needed their own tables that were then tied back to sort of the main table. Um, that was a big challenge, like just figuring out how to set it up so that we had, I think we ended up with like five tables that were all tied together. Um, but that was, that was really hard for us to, to kind of wrap our heads around. Yeah. 
All right. Thanks, Barkin team. And we're into our final project, workout metrics the fit. Here we go. Hello, I'm Cameron. I'm the developer behind WorkoutMetrics.fit. WorkoutMetrics is a web app that gives Strava users with a free account access to features that were once free to them, but now have been slowly migrated behind a premium subscription only. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with Strava, it is the leading digital community for active people. It has over 120 million users across 190 countries. Uh, you can track an activity using your phone or any GPS device and upload it to your feed. You can also tailor it to be as like, training focused and competitive or as relaxed and, and social media-esque as you prefer. The inspiration behind this came at the end of 2023 uh, when they released their annual year in sport. This is similar to what Spotify does at the end of the year where you get to go in and you get to dive into your own personalized data. Um, I discovered that this year it was also paywalled, so um, I decided I wanted to build something uh, at least similar to it. This is the landing page for Workout Metrics. From here, you can just click the Connect with Java button, but you can also scroll down to see some of the features and some of the frequently asked questions. You can toggle these to read the answers. Once you're ready, you can click the Connect with Java button, where if it's your first time, you'll be redirected to Strava to log in and authenticate the use of our app. Otherwise, you'll be redirected here to the loading page where we will start syncing your data with Strava. Once that's done, you'll land on the dashboard here component, which shows you just your year and week at a glance. It also includes down here a daily kick in the butt, which is an inspirational quote that changes daily. The charts allow you to dive into your data a little bit more and analyze trends, and you can toggle here between previous years and by default, the current year. Similarly, the stats component shows you some of the stats um, based on your data. All time is what loads by default, but you can also toggle back between individual years. The heat map component shows you where you've tracked your activities all time. So the way this works is the brighter the line, the more you've traveled that area and vice versa. So these lines over here that are pretty dim are areas I haven't gone over too much, whereas up in Denver, I've gone quite a bit. The Hall of Fame component allows you to search through your activities and favorite them for easier retrieval. In order to adhere to Strava branding guidelines, we also have this view on Strava link, which redirects you back to Strava. The Add Workout component allows you to add a file or fill out this form. And once you hit submit, it will update and add that activity to Strava and also update the dashboard component. We also included a few settings in here for user experience, you can toggle between a light and dark mode, and you can also toggle between imperial and metric units. If it's been a while since you've used the app, uh, this prob the data on here is probably outdated. Uh, so we included this refresh data button in order to resync with Strava and get everything updated. The front end of the application was built using JavaScript and React, and it is hosted on Vercel. The back end server was created using Node.js and Express, and that is hosted on Heroku. I also use this Mongoose to communicate with a Mongo database that is hosted on Mongo Atlas. At one point in time, this app used a free API to get inspirational quotes for the dashboard. But after some use, I found that it was pretty bad, the quotes I was getting back. So I built a web scraper using Node.js and Puppeteer to scrape several different websites so I can get quotes and fill that endpoint of my database. The front end uses several different libraries and APIs. Uh, to start, the charts component uses chart.js to display and animate the charts. It uses a Mapbox API for the heat map component as the map layer itself. And then it uses DeckGL as a data visualization to get the heat map data displaying on top of the map. It also uses the weather API to display the weather. And most importantly, the Strava API for user authentication, um, as well as you know getting the user's data itself. In the future, I'd like to do several things, including improving the developer experience um, by moving code over to helper functions and just improving the overall readability. Um, I'd like to implement global state management throughout React, either using Reduct or just the React library built in. Um, there's other further considerations uh, I'd like to make for the user um, that get pretty specific depending on what type of activity they primarily do. Um, but that's something I've considered. Um, and then there's also some refactor 
for scalability I'd like to do. I'm currently rate limited by Strava to only like 2000 API calls a day. Um, so it's not very scalable in the large sense, but there are some refactoring I could do to kind of work around that in a sense. Not bad for a one man project, you know, here and there. Um, Cam, here's my, here's my monetization plan for you. Okay. Despite the fact that the whole point of it was to defeat Strava's monetization. So the subscription is $10 a month, except for each tracked activity reduces your monthly fee by 50 cents. So you hit 20 workouts a month, boom, it's free. And if you don't, you already hate yourself. You might as well pay your $10. See? <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Nice. You can have that for free. You know, no royalties needed. Um, well, a little question for you. Uh, I thought the UI was like pretty sharp, um, particularly in what I would call like a mosaic. I don't know if there's a better term for it, but in terms of like fitting all the different boxes together, I um, was just wondering if you could talk about how you built that out. If you were using a, you know, third party library, or if you were doing things yourself and like how that worked. Yeah, no, that's, um, that's all just, you know, grid, um, as a grid display, um, built in react. So, um, yeah, I designed it all in, in Figma. I didn't get a chance to show that due to time, but, um, played around with that. And then, um, when it's that large, large view, it's, um, just a grid display, but then when it's optimized for mobile on smaller screens, it switches to a flex box and it's a little more evenly sized. Cool. Thanks. Priya. Yeah. Um, if your site overnight became surprisingly popular, popular and you had a million visitors a day, what do you think is going to break first? Um, I mean, it's not... The the biggest challenge I've had with all of this is kind of thinking ahead to the future with scalability for sure. Um, I kind of mentioned at the end there, I'm pretty significantly rate limited by Strava. And they're I've seen some past developers say like they sometimes get more access, but not really a whole lot. Um, so I think at that point, you know, the first thing that's gonna happen is it's, you know, people won't be able to log in and and view their view their data or anything. Um, one of the workarounds I've thought about doing but haven't implemented is, um, you know, reducing the number of API calls I make. So if, you know, for example, I've been on it for a lot of years and and myself alone, just logging in, I'm hitting their API like 10 times out of, and I'm, I get like 200 every 15 minutes. So I'm already a significant chunk of that and I'm just one user. So the refactoring I would do is you know, only showing maybe like only retrieving maybe the first one or 200 um, activities that, that are returned. And then just kind of in the background, um, as time allows, keep pulling the data and then notify the user once everything is up is updated. Thanks. Uh, Rob? Um, this is, first off, this is really impressive. I'm curious what uh, why you chose to use Mongo and what sort of um, challenges you had with that. Um, and then kind of as a secondary question, uh, have you considered uh, the legality of some of these choices, like scraping things and giving Strava features that they uh, have behind paywalls out for uh, free? Yeah, I mean, as, as far as Strava goes, um... It's funny you asked that. My lawyer friend asked the same question a couple of weeks ago. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're they're pretty developer friendly as, with this kind of stuff. Um, I'm definitely not the first person who has, in some sense, recreated some of these features and put it out there. Um, and very recently, they just started opening up a developer program where you have to submit an application. Um, so I think they are going to start kind of tightening down a little bit on that. But um, so far, they've been pretty friendly with it. Um, and then as far as Mongo goes, um, I've, I've seen, you know, I, I considered Postgres for a little bit, but I've, I was already stretching a lot on a lot of these technologies. So I ultimately chose Mongo just due to its, you know, ease of use. Um, I have some resources, you know, a, like a, a Udemy course 
I had purchased before touring goes into Mongo and I thought it was pretty easy to follow. The documentation for Mongo was also pretty easy. So, um, you know, I ultimately just chose that just in order to get it up and running. All right. Thanks, Cam. And now it's time for some judging, especially if I can stop sneezing. Um, judges and I are going to head out to breakout rooms. Okay. And <laughs> there are going to be uh, some breakout rooms for each project. You're invited, welcome to jump into those breakout rooms and ask some follow -up questions, give some kudos, et cetera. Uh, if you come in the judges breakout room, you're expelled. And that's it. All right. We conferred. It uh, had some good conversation about some projects. We picked uh, first and second place. And so, uh, number one, I want to say thanks to Laura for organizing today, helping everyone get their videos and slides and all that stuff together. Nice work with all the demos and video production and everything that goes into it. I know that's a lot of work. Um, and yeah, so they, they came through really strong and I think did a good job of, of showing off your work. Um, shout out to Jonathan for showing off uh, alumni personal project, long-term alumni personal project. Glad to have you back around. We're doing alumni showcase. When's the alumni showcase, Laura? That is on April 10th. April um, 10th. And what is that about? That is going to be, I think we're going to choose two alumni to do lightning talks. So it'll be like five minutes, either technical or non-technical. Um, we'll probably have one or two 15-minute technical conference style talks and one or two project showcases. So just kind of like showing off what our alumni can do and yeah, having some fun. Awesome. So hope you all can come back around in beginning of April. But to wrap things up today, uh, we'll put some, we have an events channel now on Slack where we put and put events and reminders and notes and registration, you can ask questions and all those things. And that'll be coming around April 10th. Um, and also, if you haven't heard it enough times, we're trying to spin up several new events this inning. Uh, so whether you're alums or students or prospective folks, um, would love to get you involved in some of those things. Check out the events channel on Slack. All right. In second place, Rob is going to tell us a little bit about our second favorite project. So the second place. Um... Actually, is it too hard to do it this way? I'll let Oh, let's pivot live pivot okay because i don't want you to have to be like this project was the da, 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 da. we All get right. a drum roll or like what's yeah on? we're air drum roll in second place it is workout, workout metrics. metrics we thought this project was super sweet it was really cool how far um how far a single individual can get with um with the front end and the back end um there's a lot of good consideration on the end user um the usage of third party libraries we think was a really smart decision um and the ui was excellent very polished and um all in all a great idea with uh really good execution thanks rob there are air drums now i don't know yeah and Priya is going to share with us our first place project was weather together. All right. We thought it had uh, well a plus for integrating observability. It was fun and engaging. They utilized a wide map of technologies. They considered deployment and scaling, and they were able to pivot to a React front end. So congratulations. All right, that's everything for demo comp. Thanks, judges, for all your uh, attention and questions and so forth. Kudos to all the demoing presenters today. We'll do it again in seven weeks from today. Uh, and otherwise, hope to see you at some other events and classes and whatnot soon. That's it for me. Have a good rest of your evening.